Uh, a warm welcome to everyone again, and thank you very much for joining this webinar. So we have, let me just quickly show you the agenda. We have quite a packed 90 minute agenda focusing on the important role of the leadership team of banks in setting climate targets, uh, specifically scope three finance emission reduction targets. So in, um, so I'd like to open this webinar now. And uh, my name is Yuki Yasui. I'm the Asia Pacific uh, Regional Coordination Manager at UNEP Finance Initiative based in Bangkok. Um, I've been at UNEP F5 for the last 20 years uh, working on sustainable finance. So, um, as you know, the ecosystem of sustainable finance initiative has been growing rapidly in the Asia Pacific and UNEP F5 is very happy to be co-hosting today's webinar with WWF Singapore and supported by GFANS and ICB. Uh, GFANS is the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, and ICB is the Indonesian Sustainable Finance Initiative hosted by the Indonesian Financial Services Authority and managed by WWF Indonesia. So uh, today's webinar is um, hosted by UNEP FI's Principles for Responsible Banking, which is starting its capacity building program on climate target setting for its signatories. And today's webinar is a public kickoff event targeted at the leadership team of the banks. So um, climate target setting, as you know, requires institutional change, uh, which in turn, can only be initiated by strong leadership from the top. So we hope that you will gain ideas and inspiration out of our distinguished speakers today. So without further ado, uh, let me start uh, introducing the opening uh, remarks, the speakers for the opening remarks. So um, Eric Asher is my boss and he is the head of the U UNEP uh, finance initiative, which uh, is a global partnership that brings together the UN with the global financial sector, working on sustainable finance agenda. So he joined UNEP FI in 2015, uh, and Eric also sits. Uh, 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 he joined UNEP FI in 2015, and he also sits on other sustainable finance industry bodies, including the. Um, the, the PRI, the Principles for Responsible Investment, and also the gov uh, governing bodies of the Sustainable Stock Exchanges Initiative and the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. Uh, I also have Ms. Miyuki Zenia, uh, Deputy Head of Global Sustainability at Daiichi Life Holdings and Head of Sustainable Finance at the Daiichi Life Insurance Company. So, Ms. Zenia is also representing GFANS today. Um, Mr. Seiji Inagaki, the president of Daiichi Life Insurance, is a principals group member of GFANS. So, Ms. Zenia has been responsible for incorporating ESG approaches into the entire portfolio of Daiichi Life Insurance, which totals about 38 trillion yen and for promoting global sustainability at Daiichi Life Holdings. Since she joined Daiichi Life in 2013, she has played a leadership role regarding stewardship activities and in promoting sustainable finance, not only at Daiichi Life, but also in Japan. Um, she is board, a board member of the Global Steering Group for Impact Investments, Japan Advisory Board, and is co-chair of the APEC Investor Advisory Group of the Value Reporting Foundation. Okay, Eric, over to you then. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, very good. Okay, well, pleased to be uh, with you all today in, in virtual format as we're getting more and more uh, used to these days. Um, so we're really excited to have this session today. Um, under the auspices of the, uh, the UN Principles for Responsible Banking. Uh, we are coming up to uh, nearly 300 signatories today uh, and approaching uh, nearly half of global assets. 
under management uh, within the banking industry who are, are signed up um, to this new responsible banking community. Um, together, committed to aligning business strategy with societal goals as expressed by the UN Sustainable Development Goals and um, certainly global climate uh, change um, measures to address. Um, the PRB signatories uh, start their journey by establishing systems or processes to monitor impact across all their lines of business, uh, both the positive impacts, the, the positive change they can help create, but also um, the negative impacts that they understand increasingly that they need to be able to monitor and, and act upon. Now, with, with impact management systems um, in place, and there's a lot of work to do that, um, they then work to uh, uh, prioritize um, and identify what they believe in any uh, space of time are the most significant impact areas that, that need to be addressed. Um, these impacts uh, that create on, on people and planet, to use the expression, and not so much through their own activities in terms of your paper consumption or your energy consumptions, your, your CO2 emissions, but really it's about the impact that you have through your financing activities. So how do you help your clients create positive change and address those that might create negative uh, externalities? So now based on internationally developed guidance, um, signatories then establish targets, business targets to create progressively improving uh, positive net positive impact from your bank's financing activities. Now, climate mitigation, so the re reduction of CO2 and other uh, greenhouse gas emitting, uh, emissions uh, is identified as the top impact area by PRB banks globally, even if they are also working on, on various other issues uh, concurrently at the same time. But if we focus in on climate, which is the, the, the topic today, um, certainly, you know, the direct response to climate risks um, has been identified through the, the recommendations of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. It's very important um, uh, in terms of a risk identification activity, but the required response goes beyond traditional risk management, you know, such, as, such as putting your, your improved uh, due diligence process in place. Um, you know, many of the ESG risks faced by banks today, including climate change, are very global and systemic. And um, you know, uh, requiring putting in place new types of, of frameworks to properly understand to assess these new, particularly the forward-looking risks, which is is certainly key to understanding the scale of the exposure, and then rethinking the client relationship to really energize and capitalize on the climate transition. This is central to rethinking big business practice, banking practice today. Increasingly, uh, banks around the world are realizing they need to be actively part of the solution and engaging with and financing clients to transition rapidly towards low carbon and fully decarbonized business activity. The UNIPFI, uh, under the PRB framework, we have a number of initiatives uh, focused on climate action, um, supporting our signatories. And we, we, we have, includingly, the very high profile Net Zero Banking Alliance, which we're very pleased to be convening as part of GFANS, the Global Financial Alliances for Net Zero. But we're also doing so much more, and we're going to start to dig into the details of that today. We are starting a new capacity building program for our members on climate emissions target setting and implementation. And through this program, uh, uh, participants are going to learn how to measure the emissions associated with their different portfolios, how to set business targets for reducing emissions in line, in, in line with the latest scientific modeling, and how to define policies and strategies to align overall portfolios with global and national climate goals. Finally, to do all of this, it's all about engaging with your clients and helping them move along through this transition. At UNIPFI, uh, we really believe the role of banks in society is changing. And to respond, banks really need to adjust their business strategy and make it a lot, uh, a lot of changes across the organization. So we really encourage banks who have yet to join the PRB to join us so you can work with other banks from around the world in this big, significant, largest ever and, and is critical to all of our activities transition. Thank you very much. And Yuki, I hand it back to you. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, so climate target setting is both an impact creation and a risk mitigation exercise for banks. Um, I'd like to now turn the floor to Ms. Miyuki Zenia of Daiichi Life. Over to you, Ms. Miyuki. Thank you. 
Thank you, Yasi san. Uh, it's my great honor to be invited for this special opportunity today. And me, Xenia, I would like to express my strong expectation for banks, which help hold the key to economic de development in the Asia Pacific region, which will be the global center of the economy in the near future. And for sustainable and resilient future, I believe that banks will play a crucial role by considering and cooperating together to tackle climate risk. First of all, I would like to briefly explain why we are the first company in Asia to join the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. We are a Japanese life insurance company established in 1902. As an institutional investor holding a wide range of asset classes around the world, as well as a life insurance company, we kept our asset management policy unchanged, which emphasized profit profitability, safety, liquidity, and public interest. We are also conscious of our diverse stakeholders. Since the establishment of the Japanese Stewardship Court in 2014 and our signing to the PRI in 2015, we have continuously defined our responsible investment policy. And we have a we have long recognized sorry, uh, we have long recognized addressing climate change as a top priority issue. As the IPCC report and other reports have made it clear, actions to tackle global warming are inevitable. Recognize the need to tackle, uh, take action as a large scale. As an asset owner, we are committed to monitoring and analyzing the GHG emissions of our portfolio to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. And you may remember the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance was launched in 2019 on the occasion of UN Climate Week in New York. And I myself was there to see the growing excitement to tackle for climate change among global asset owners. The following year, the Japanese government issued a new energy policy on carbon neutrality. Encouraged by this big step, we joined Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance as the first Asian asset owner in February 2021 and have publicly announced a commitment to a commitment on net zero by 2050 and 25 reduction targets by 2025. Next, I would like to introduce our activities in G funds. In preparation on for COP26 in April 2021, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, G funds in short, was established. G Fund is a coalition for financial institutions bringing together various Net Zero Alliance. And we have been a member of the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. We became a member of G Funds. G Funds is led by a principal's group comprised CEOs from financial industry. And uh, as already mentioned, our CEO, Mr. Nagaki, was elected of this CEO principal's group member. At the CEO principal's meetings, discussions are held regularly with members representing each Net Zero Alliance, including Net Zero Banking Alliance. In addition to the above, we are also a member of two working groups of G funds, which examine tradi uh, transition plans for financial institutions and net zero pathways by country or region. We have been actively involved in developing principles to promote net zero by financial institutions at the working group level. The reason we are actively joining these activities is that we like to reflect our views as Japanese or Asian financial institutions in the recommendations and guidance developed by G funds. A chance for the private sector to define the framework for transition plans just as was done for climate risk disclosures and TCFD. Finally, I would like to state my expectations for those joining today. I understand that some of the banks joining today are members of the Net Zero Banking Alliance. Why others not yet? Regardless of whether you are members or not, we believe that financial institutions could play an important role for the future society. And I would like to stress that it will be more difficult for everyone to achieve the Net Zero if we do not work together with as many as banks as possible. In addition, we believe the financial institutions should play a much greater role in managing crime risk and creating business opportunities with the corporate clients. And as a result, the banks themselves could be resilient and sustainable. 
The challenging this challenges and situation faced by banks, asset owners, or regions may differ. However, whichever institutions you are, the wisdom gained from joining GFAT will be invaluable. And even if it is difficult to join right now, you can refer the materials published by GFAS, and we hope to work towards net zero together using them. The response to the climate change is more complex than ever, including not only global warming countermeasures, but also consideration of biodiversity and human rights. And it is necessary to seek solutions while engaging with multi stakeholders. From this state perspective, we believe that the role of the banks, which have connections with various stakeholders, could be a driving force. Even if some financial institutions might be still in the early stage of implementation for net zero, we believe that sharing the knowledge of other banks and advanced practices is an effective way to accelerate the implementation of initiatives in the short term remaining until 2030. To this end, I would like to say that it is important for responsible financial institutions to share a sense of urgency to reach net zero and work together beyond national or industry frameworks so that we can hand over a bright future to the next generation. I would like to conclude my opening remarks by wishing today's seminar be a meaningful chance for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Miyuki Danielle. Um, yeah, and uh, thank you very much for encouraging banks to join the net zero and to start climate target setting. It's very important uh, to hear from a large investor like yourself. Thank you. So now let me um, introduce the next speaker and I will just quickly share the screen so that you can see the name. It's Mr. S.H. Corp. He is the Chief Strategy and Sustainability Officer of Shinhan Financial Group. Um, Mr. Ko is also the UNFFI's Global Steering Committee member from April this year. So, Mr. Ko, welcome. Um, Mr. Ko has joined Shinhan Bank in 1994 and has built up his career in various fields, such as the Shinhan Financial Group's business strategy, management of group subsid subsidiaries, and brand promotion. Uh, he was appointed the Chief Strategy and Sustainability Officer uh, in 2022 and has made the financial group the first Korean financial institution to introduce quantitative evaluation of group subsidiaries for carbon reduction and eco-friendly financial sector. So thank you very much, Mr. Ko, for joining. And uh, the floor is yours. Just to let you let, let everyone know that uh, there will be a consecutive translation of Mr. Ko's uh, speech. So over to you. Let's meet everyone. Uh, my name is SH Ko and take charge of uh, strategy and the ESG of uh, Shinan Financial Group, South Korea. And um, I'm not so good at English, yeah, just uh, survival English level. <laughs> and uh, I can, I will speak Korean and uh, my colleague uh, interpret it. Yeah, uh, ask, uh, ask for your understanding. Uh, 가능한 금융 확산을 위해 노력해 주시는 아시아 태평양 리더 분들을 뵐수 있게 돼서 반갑습니다. I would like I would like to say that it's very nice to meet you all the leaders of Asia Pacific region who are working hard to expand sustainable finance. 오늘 이 자리를 빌어 어 저희 신한금융그룹이 2008년에 UNFFI에 가입한 이후 어 PRB NGBA 이니셔티브 수립 등에 참여해 온 과정에서 어, 얻게 된 경험 그리고 저희 신한 그룹의 ESG의 변화에 대해서 좀 말씀드릴 수 있는 기회를 갖게 돼서 어, 영광으로 생각합니다. Uh, as an active member of UNFFI GSC, I am honored to take this opportunity today to share my experiences and many phases of change since Shinan joined UNFFI in 2008 and then in the process of participating in PRB and NZBA. 
어, 최초 저희 신한 금융 그룹도 어, CSR 차원에서 ESG가 시작되었습니다. 그 대부분의 한국 금융 기관들이 ESG를 홍보 부분에서 그 수행을 해 왔고요. 어, 지금 현재에도 어, 상당수의 금융 기관은 ESG를 홍보 부분에서 어, 담당하고 있는 상황입니다. As was the case with most Korean financial institutions, ESG in Shenhan was first initiated as part of its CSR business, and the group's PR division took charge of ESG-related activities. Um, this continues to be the case for some financial institutions in Korea, where the PR departments take charge of ESG. 하지만 ESG가 어떤 CSR에 집중하던 시기를 넘어서서 어떤 CSV로 좀 확대되었고 어, 특히 몇년 전부터는 어떤 기후 변화 대응과 어, 넷제로라는 어떤로 대변되는 그이 e 영역의 중요성이 엄청나게 커지고 있는 것이 사실입니다. However, ESG has progressed past the CSR focused phase and expanded and developed into a corporate social value phase, so the CSV phase. Over the past few years, the importance of E, the environment, represented by climate action and net zero in particular, has grown tremendously. 그 이런 변화에 따라서 저희 신화는 그 ESG가 어떤 홍보나 PR 또는 어, 브랜드 관리 차원에서 수행될 수 있는 어떤 아젠다가 아니고 어, 필연적으로 어떤 전략과 결부됨으로써 어, 보다 적극적으로 지속 가능 경영을 추진해야 된다는 어, 인식을 어, 갖게 되었고 어, 그 결과 2018년부터 어, 전략에서 ESG를 총괄하고 담당하게 되었습니다. Amid the, these changes, Shinan recognized that ESG can no longer be carried out at the level of corporate publicity or brand management. And in 2018, we decided that the group's strategy division would take charge of ESG for a more effective, active planning and implementation of sustainability management that is inevitably linked to the group's overall strategy. 저희 신한그룹에서 어, 전략 부분이 기존의 전략 부분이 어떤 일을 그 수행하고 담당하느냐를 먼저 잠깐 말씀을 드리면 어, 대부분의 금융기관의 전략 부분에서 수행하는 것처럼 어, 그야말로 스트레티지, 어, 전략, 그리고 거버넌스, 어, 그룹 포트폴리오, 어, M&A, 어, 매니징 음, 플래닝, 어, 그 다음에 어젠다 뭔가 조정, 이런 영역을 담당하고 있습니다. The main role, if I may explain to you, of um, Shinan Financial Group Strategy Division is actually to plan and adjust the group strategy and its business portfolio, including reviewing M&A opportunities, also governance and um, management, uh, adjusting management plans. 전략 부분에서 어, 이런 전략 부분에서 ESG를 담당하게 되면서 그 전략과 ESG 전반의 어떤 연결, 연계 그리고 ESG 추진을 통 위해서는 어떤 구동 체계 실제로 이걸 실행할 수 있는 그 인파워먼트가 어, 상당히 중요한데 이런 어떤 그 ESG를 위한 조직 체계, 목표, 평가 등에 있어서. 보다 강력한 어떤 추진력을 가지게 되었습니다. Therefore, the strategy division has strong execution power in linking ESG strategy with the group's overall strategy, as well as in empowering or strengthening uh, Shinhan's ESG driving system that consists of organization, target setting, and KPI setting. Such efforts led to strong execution power throughout Shinhan. 오늘 그 주요 아젠다가 ESG 중에서도 어떤 넷째로 영역인데요. 이 저희 신한그룹은 방금 설명드린 것과 같이 어 전략 부분에서 ESG를 담당하면서 이 넷째로 영역에 있어서도 좀 강화된 실행력을 가지고 추진할 수 있었습니다. 
So with uh, the strategy department taking charge, Shinhan was able to promote ESG with enhanced implementation power in pursuing not only our general ESG management, but, all, but our net zero ambitions. 어, 실제로 경과를 말씀을 드리면 그 2020년 그 지지난해 재작년이죠. 2020년에 그 동아시아 금융그룹 최초로 넷째로 전략을 수립을 했습니다. 어, 넷째로 전략은 어, 2050년까지 우리 저희 스컵 1,2인 어, 내부 배출량뿐 아니라 스컵 3인 금융 배출량을 넷째로로 만들겠다는 어, 제로 카본 드라이브 전략을 수립했는데요. 이러한 과정은 기존의 홍보 부문이 ESG를 담당했다면 과연 이게 이제 원활히 가능했을까? 어, 라는 이제 그 생각을 지금 하게 되는데요. 이게 전략 부분이 담당을 함으로써 어떤 리스크를 비롯한 어, 필수적인 유관 부서 협업을 이끌어내서 결국 이런 전략과 목표를 수립할 수 있었다고 생각합니다. If I can just walk you through some of the things that we've done over the past few years. In 2020, so two, two years ago, uh, we were the first financial institution in East Asia to set net zero targets. So Shenan established its net zero initiative called Zero Carbon Drive, which aims to reach net zero by 2050 in not it, only in its own CO2 emissions, but also its financed emissions. So when I look back, I don't think the implementation power could have happened with the PR department in charge, but uh, with the strategy planning team and strategy di division in charge, we were able to get good collaboration with the related departments, including the risk management team. 이렇게 전략과 어떤 목표가 수립이 되었지만 이걸 실제로 이제 실행을 하려면 그걸 이끌 수 있는 어떤 구동 체계, 특히 조직 체계가 어, 셋업이 되어야지만 가능한데요. 그 아까 말씀드렸지만 바로 이 조직 체계에 대한 어떤 그 아레나를 전략 부분이 가지고 있습니다. 그러다 보니 이 ESG 추진을 위한 그 어떤 그룹과 주요 서브시디어리의 어떤 ESG 조직 강화를 어, 이끌어낼 수 있었는데요. 그래서 그, 그 저희 주요 그룹 사에 이사회 내에 ESG 소위원회를 운영하고. 어, 헤드쿼터의 각 그룹사 헤드쿼터의 ESG 전담 부서 신설 등을 주도함으로써 이런 넷제로를 위한 실행력을 강화하는 조직 체계를 셋업할 수 있었습니다. So with this strategy in place, we needed a strong organization for a strong implementation. So um, since the Shenhan's strategy department is also in charge of the corporate organizational structures, we have determined that strengthening and empowering the ESG organization of our subsidiaries was essential to an effective implementation of our ESG initiatives. With this understanding, Shinhan operated, operates um, an ESG subcommittee within the board of directors of major subsidiaries and have newly established ESG departments in the headquarters of these major subsidiaries to strengthen the execution power of the entire group. 그리고 어, 금년에 있어서는 어, 실제로 탄소 배출량을 측정하고 어, 이걸 CEO 평가에 도입을 실제로 시작을 했는데요. 어, 역시 마찬가지로 그 전략 부분이 그룹사 CEO의 주요 전략 과제의 평가를 담당하고 있습니다. 그러다 보니 금년부터 전 그룹사 CEO 평가에 있어서 ES 전반을 좀 반영을 최초로 어, 우리 대한민국 금융그룹 최초로는 반영을 하였고요. 특히 탄소 배출량과 친환경 금융 실적을 주요 ESG 평가 항목으로 운영하게 되었습니다. 그리고 이를 위해 어, 탄소 배출량을 측정하는 모델을 구축해 실제로 측정을 하고 어, 이걸 평가에 반영하는 어, 구동 체계를 금년부터 가동하고 있습니다. And um, the strategy department is also in charge of um, setting the KPIs for all the group's subsidiaries. So from this year, in addition to strengthening the organizational system, ESG has been reflected in the CEO KPIs of all group companies. 
um, in particular, CO2 reduction and green finance performance are some of the items that were included in the ESG evaluation within the CEO KPIs. So for uh, effective ESG evaluation, we have built CO2 measurement systems and became the first Korean company to have the system in operation. 지금까지 어떤 신한의 ESG를 실행을 실제로 실행력을 강화하기 위한 그간의 어떤 경험과 어떤 변화에 대해서 말씀을 드렸고요. 그 특히 탄소 넷째로에 대해서도 어떤 전략과 결부됨으로써 좀 이제 가속화되고 있는 신한의 어떤 움직임에 대해서 말씀드렸습니다. 나라별로 또그 금융 기관별로 어, 여건과 상황이 좀 다를 수 있을 거라고 생각을 합니다. 하지만 저희 그 신한 파이낸셜 그룹은 어떤 ESG는 전략과 긴밀히 결부되어서 어, 하여튼 추진되는 게 어떤 ESG 실행력과 지속성을 위해 필수 불가결한 방향이라고 확신하고 있습니다. So I've now told you about the experiences and the many uh, phases of change that Shinhan has experienced in terms of pursuing its ESG ambitions and also its net zero ambitions and how um, the net zero related in, uh, initiative is being accelerated here in Shinhan. Um, now what I want to emphasize is, is that Although I think that conditions and circumstances may differ from country to country and from company to company, Shinhan is convinced that the integration of strategy and ESG is an indispensable direction for a strong and sustainable ESG execution. 나아가 ESG의 어떤 범위와 역할이 그 정말 엄청난 속도로 빠르게 확대가 되고 있습니다. 그래서 ESG가 어떻게 보면 가장 중요한 경영의 주요 영역이 될 거라고 저는 생각하고 있고요. 결국은 어떤 뭐 과거의 홍보 그리고 지금의 전략 같은 업무와 겸직이 아니라 ESG가 경영의 가장 중요한 어떤 그, 그 시레벨 임원의 역할이고 ESG를 독립적으로 총괄하는 어, 어떤 파워풀한 어떤 시레벨 경영진이 결국은 필요하게 될 것이라고 어, 좀 예상하고 있습니다. Uh, furthermore, with rapid expansion of the scope and the role of ESG, I believe that ESG will become the most important area of business management, and eventually, an independent top management will be required to oversee ESG rather than taking a concur concurrent role with other tasks such as strategy or public relations. 음. 앞으로 저희 신한금융그룹은 넷째로의 실질적인 실행, 어떤 뭐그 어떤 선언을 넘어서서 실행에 좀 총력을 기울일 예정입니다. 앞서 말씀드린 내용에 더해서 그 ESG 모형을 기반으로 한 금융 상품의 출시라든가 어 어떤 친환경 정용 펀드의 어떤 확대를 통한 녹색 금융의 전체적인 그 확대 그리고 저희가 대출하고 투자를 하는 기업의 평가에 있어서 어, ESG를 명확하게 반영함으로써 어떤 그 넷째로 실행에 좀 진정성을 가지고 노력할 것입니다. Uh, going forward, Shinhan will focus on the execution, the action of net, pursuing net zero. In addition to the aforementioned, Shinhan will strive to implement a low carbon transition with sincerity. Uh, such efforts will include launching ESG model-based financial products, expanding green finance through the creation of eco-friendly funds, and reflecting corporate corporate ESG evaluation results in investments and loan decisions. 오늘 간략하게 좀 발표 말씀드린 내용이 어떤 넷째로라는 어려운 과제를 위해서 애쓰시는 그 아시아 태평양의 그 NGBA 그 금융 기관들과 여러분 리더들에게 어 조금이나마 도움이 되었다면 좋겠습니다.
I hope that what I have shared with you today will be helpful to all the members of Asia Pacific um, NZBA. And as we face um, the difficult task of net zero finance together. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Kerr. That was excellent. Um, thank you for articulating the important role that the leadership team has in the bank and how the ESG and especially climate agenda is becoming a core business strategy uh, for, for banks uh, in Shinhan and uh, around uh, the world as well. So uh, thank you. And I will now um, share my screen again, just to introduce the next speaker, which is my colleague Remco Fisher. He is the climate lead of UNEP Finance Initiative and uh, Remco joined UNEP FI in 2007 and since 2012 has been building, building the climate change work program at UNEP FI. So he has led the establishment of the UN convened Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. Today, a group of 70 institutional investors committed to transitioning over $10 trillion in asset to net zero emissions by 2050 and also subsequently the establishment of the UN convened Net Zero Banking Alliance that now convenes over 100 banks with over $65 trillion in assets. Uh, Remco has also been instrumental in UNFFI's work on TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. So um, if anyone has any questions to Remco, please do post it in the Q&A. And uh, he doesn't have time uh, to maybe answer live, but we will make sure that we respond via the chat function or by email after the seminar. So over to you, Ramka, I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuki. I, I hope you can hear me okay. And uh, good afternoon to all uh, of you in, in Asia from a, a very early morning in London, but at least it's it's sunny here where I am. So that's, that's a good thing, uh, despite the, the early timing here. Um, uh, as Yuki said, I, I, I lead the, the climate change portfolio at UNEPFI. And what I wanted to do today was to, um, in light of the focus of the session, which is Net zero transitioning aligning portfolios to give um, to, to give you a sense of what that actually translates into more tangibly, more concretely. What are the real steps that a financial institution typically, whether you're a bank investor insurer, have to go through uh, to implement your net zero or Paris alignment uh, journey? Um, before I do that, though, um, uh, just a little bit of context, and for that, uh, we can stay in exactly on this slide here that you're showing, Yuki. This is, uh, Eric's already spoken to this, and, and Yuki, you've spoken to this too. This is the overview of the Climate Change Work Program at UNEPFI. You don't have to look at the fine print, that's, that's uh, not necessary here. The main point is that, of course, we're working with banks, investors, and insurers, which you can see on the right-hand side of the slide here. Our work with investors is really done in partnership with the PRI, but more importantly, you can see that our work is structured into two prongs. They're um, quite intuitive. They should be not too new uh, uh, for most of you, uh, but still worth just quickly going over them. The first horizontal line that you'll see here is the uh, what we call the climate risk work, and that's work that responds to the so-called um, outside-in materiality of climate change. So this responds to how climate change is and other environmental uh, challenges are shifting risk landscapes in the real economy and how those risks are then uh, by extension uh, detrimentally impacting the financial portfolio uh, the financial portfolio of uh, the financial performance of portfolios and this work is responding to the tcfd so ultimately it's about helping financial institutions identify assess quantify and ultimately disclose those uh, climate related risks the, the, the bottom part of the slide speaks about our climate alignment work. This responds to the inside out materiality of climate change. So focuses on the impacts that financial institutions through their operations and portfolios and financing decisions have on climate change related parameters, <coughs> such as critically greenhouse gas <coughs> emissions, apologies. Here, the, the work really boils down to um, ultimately to setting 
science-based, scenario-based decarbonization targets for financial portfolios uh, that are in line with net zero emissions, uh, ideally by 2050, um, in a temperature uh, alignment um, um, or in alignment with the temperature outcome of ideally 1.5 degrees by 2100. And all of this work, uh, Yuki, you've just said it, we are doing through the three net UN convened net zero finance sector alliances that we facilitate, uh, the one for banks, the one for asset owners, and one for insurers. We can move on to the next slide. You should be able to see here is what does this mean, aligning a portfolio with, with Paris Agreement or transitioning it? It's quite intuitive. It means simply that the greenhouse gas emissions that a portfolio is exposed to, or the greenhouse gas emissions that are contained, in other words, within a portfolio, could use over time in line, in, in lockstep, with um, the greenhouse gas emissions pathways, the scientific pathways um, that we know are consistent uh, with that, um, with the Paris Agreement and with the implied temperature outcome objective. If that happens at the level of the portfolio, also what is happening at the same time is that on that portfolio of the financial institution, there's a replacement. I think that's, that's a key word here. There's a replacement going on, namely a replacement of high carbon, unsustainable exposures, assets, technologies, infrastructure, you name it, with the equivalent of that, the sustainable, low carbon um, assets, technologies, businesses, um, um, infrastructures, um, et cetera. And we need that replacement of the unsustainable with the sustainable, of the high carbon with the low carbon, so that ultimately emissions will start going down we need that replacement both in the real world, of course, and for us to achieve it in the real world, we need that replacement also at the level of financial portfolio. Is that happening at the moment? We can move on to the next slide. Here, this slide, what it shows us, that replacement is not happening. This is an example for the power sector. There's been a lot of growth, as we all know, in green investment, meaning investment basically in the power sector, that's investment into renewable energy. And there's a lot of investment still um, going into renewables in the power sector, which is highlighted here in the light green columns. The problem is that global investment into fossil fuel based generation is not decreasing, at least not at, these, at the speed to which it should decrease for pa Paris compatibility. And that means ultimately that despite that growth in green investment, Emissions are not going down as they should. In fact, you know, this year we all know emissions are going back up again, and um, and so um, so we're not replacing it. We're building a green element on top of the unsustainable element in our economy and also in our portfolios. And we need to change that. And that's why aligning portfolios is important because it gets us focused on that notion of replacement. We can move on to the to the next slide here, and this is um, how I'll start to the next 10 minutes of my presentation, taking you through the five key steps that any financial institution who's committed to net zero uh, would have to go through in its journey towards achieving that uh, commitment. Number one um, is defining the level of ambition. What is the, the, the level of ambition that a financial institution is signing up for? What's the long term finality of that uh, commitment? Number two is what are what's not the long term finality, but how do you then deconstruct that long term long term finality into more short term, <clears throat> more digestible, more near term uh, concrete um, uh, measures, especially intermediary portfolio targets that you will want to achieve not in 30 years time, but rather in five or 10 years time. The third step is then to assess where your portfolio is at now and where the portfolio, the financial portfolio would go naturally. Would you not be doing in, as a financial institution any additional interventions uh, over the next year? So would it continue growing its emissions? Would it, you know, plateauing emissions? Would it be going down? Because based on that baseline, then as a financial institution, you can put in place the strategies and the measures needed to be able to adjust for that and to bend. Uh, the, the portfolio emissions pathway further down so that indeed it becomes uh, compatible with Paris. And then the last step, of course, is that over time, there needs to be a tracking 
the reporting on progress. Next slide, please. Let's start with number one. Establish specify net zero, uh, the net zero am ambition. And I'm not going to say net zero by 2050 here, despite the slide saying it, I'm just going to say the net zero ambition. So what are some of the key aspects that need to be part of that step of establishing the ambition? Number one, which emissions are in, sc in scope? Are we talking about the uh, scope one and scope two? So the operational emissions of the financial institution, things like, you know, banks, buildings, uh, the, the the, the, the travel and commute of, of financial institution staff, or are we looking at the emissions associated with portfolios? And as I've said, our focus and the focus of the Net Zero Alliance is, of course, is, or 99% of that focus is portfolio emissions, because this is how financial institutions have impact um, and influence in the economy. Uh, if it is portfolio emissions, then what parts of the portfolio should be in scope for this target and for this ambition? What are the asset classes? What are the geography, the geographic exposures that should be a part of this? What are the sectoral exposures that should be a part of this? In our UNEP facilitated alliances, again, the three that I've mentioned earlier, um, the full portfolio is in scope, all of it. Everything that is on the portfolio is in scope to be decarbonized, but we appreciate that um, uh, uh, financial institutions will start first with certain parts of the portfolio for which, for instance, there are uh, the most advanced methodologies already and over time add other parts um, of the portfolio onto, onto that, that effort um, and into those targets. Um, then if we're looking at another question is if we're looking at portfolio emissions, so the emissions of the clients and the inv investee companies of financial institutions, and at that level, what is the scope? There are three scopes, scope one, scope two, scope three of emissions of those companies. Uh, are, are they the, the direct emissions of the companies? Are they the supply chain emissions of the companies? If it's the supply chain emissions, which part of the supply chain, uh, et cetera. And here, what we started saying in our alliances is that the, the emissions that should be in scope for clients and investee companies should be those that are most material for the sector at hand. So, for instance, for power generation, that would be scope one, because that's the, those are the most significant emissions for power generation. For oil and gas, though, it should be scope three, because that's the most significant part of um, the emissions in the oil and gas industry. And you can do this for every sector. That's the guidance that we have been given, giving uh, on this topic as you notify. Last and then two more questions, which types of uh, greenhouse gas emissions are in scope? CO2, of course, everyone's focused on CO2, but also there's, there's, there's five or six other types of greenhouse gas emissions called the Kyoto um, greenhouse gas emission. And in, in our UNFFI frameworks, all of the, green, all of the greenhouse gas, Kyoto, uh, Kyoto greenhouse gases are in scope. And then finally, and importantly, there needs to be um, a decision not only as to when the point in time at which net zero emissions for the portfolio will be reached, but there needs to be also a decision as to is this going to be in alignment with what's the temperature alignment? And typically that this gets described as a temperature alignment by 2100. Are we aligning with a 1.5 degrees pathway or are we aligning with a well below two or are we aligning with a, a, a two degree pathway? Next slide, please. And this slide just very quickly tells you something about this notion of uh, what's the relationship between the point in time at which you reach net zero with whether you're with with the temperature, the ultimate temperature outcome that you're aligning with. And I think uh, in a simplistic way, and I want to underline the word simplistic, net zero by 2050 has become shorthand for aligning with 1.5. Net zero by 2065, as you can see here, becomes shorthand for aligning with two degrees. And of course, if you want to align with well below two degrees, which is the wording of the Paris Agreement, you would have to land net zero emissions somewhere in between 2050 and 2065. Next slide, please. And I'm just going to say this is this is the GFENS ecosystem here. You can see three of the alliances in GFENS are facilitated by UNEP, but there's other uh, alliances here. And all of these alliances have in common that their underlying commitment is for 1.5. 
so meaning for uh, net zero by 2050. Next slide, please. Uh, the second important step um, uh, uh, here in the journey is that once the long term journey destination has been established as per the previous slide, that needs to be broken down into short term, more quantitative, more operational intermediary targets. And a few, a few key aspects here are, of course, um, uh, which emissions pathway, which model is being used to inform the target. Is it the IEA net zero by 2050? Is it the OECM 1.5 target? Is it the NGFS scenarios? What assumptions are being made in those in those scenarios? So in other words, what assumptions are you making as a financial institution as you're setting your your short short term targets? Of course, the, the way the targets um, targets can be set for the full portfolio. There can be a, a portfolio wide decarbonization target. There can be sector specific targets. Um, the metrics need to be established. Are we looking at absolute emissions, sector intensities, or are we looking at a technology mix? Um, are the targets due by 2025 or 2030? And are we looking only at outcomes-based targets, so results targets such as a, a, a carbon reduction, or are we looking also at activity-based targets such as um, engaging the number of clients that you want to engage with, et cetera? Next slide, please. And I, I appreciate I only have one minute left, so I'll keep the next couple of slides pretty short. There's a few slides here that tell you how within the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance and within the Net Zero Banking Alliance, these targets are being set at the moment. Uh, I'm not going to go cover this in detail now because we don't have the time, but the slides can be circulated afterwards, so you can have this information uh, at your fingertips. Um, and so I think we can move on to the next slide. This is for the Asset Owner Alliance. Next slide. Also, asset owner alliance. This is the banking alliance. How target setting is uh, is evolving. There, the one thing I will say is, of course, that uh, how these intermediary targets are set for 2025 or latest 2030 is highly regulated. It's highly agreed upon uh, through the governance structures of these alliances. Uh, next slide, please. And we can go on. Next slide. So let me just there's there's uh, uh, two more slides here. Um, uh, the the third step is you need to make sense of as a financial institution of where your portfolio would develop um, if you were not if we you won't do anything if you won't do any additional interventions would the emissions in the portfolio if you did nothing go up they plateau they go down that provides you uh, the baseline for action. Of course, all of this analysis importantly would have to be carried out using the same metrics and the same scope that you use for the target setting to create consistency between the target your assessment of the status quo and then the measures that you wouldn't put in place and that's the next slide what are the measures and the strategies that financial institutions then can put in place to from the to adjust the baseline so that the portfolio becomes uh, aligned with with Paris. There are two broad areas of action. The financial institutions can include in their strategies. Engagement is number one, and portfolio steering is the other one. On engagement, um, which most people, many people believe to be the most impactful, you can engage portfolio companies, entire industries, the financial value chain, policymakers, etc. And when it comes to portfolio steering, that is a reallocation of capital from certain parts of the economy, certain companies within sectors to other companies in that sector or to other sectors altogether. So that the portfolio decarbonizes accordingly. And my last slide and I'll wrap up um, is then once you start implementing uh, those actions, we can go to the next slide. Once you start implementing th those, those actions um, and measures, over time, you need to measure progress and you need to disclose that progress. That's a key requirement in the alliances that we have. And here again, that progress needs to be measured, of course, logically using the same scope and the same metrics that you used for the target setting so that there's a clear relationship uh, between uh, between the target and the, re and the progress report. Uh, but of course, uh, progress reporting can, can also go beyond and add additional color and information. The last thing I will say is that 
when financial institutions are implementing their, uh, their, their strategies, some things they will do by themselves. But on other things, they can do that a lot better if they're working in concert together with peers. And this is where the net zero alliances really shine because they give common platforms for financial institutions to work together on key topics such as scientific pathways, such as regulations that are needed uh, to support these, these efforts, et cetera. I'll just leave it there uh, and thank you all for, for, your, for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Remco. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for running through the, the target setting protocol for climate uh, emissions reduction. So if you join the PRB, um, 90 plus percent of PRB banks also set climate target setting and they are encouraged to follow the net zero banking alliance protocol that, that Remco has talked through although they don't necessarily set it at net zero by 2050. Um, so that's what uh, Remco was referring in his presentation as well. Okay, um, so we will move on. Thanks very much, Remco. And I will quickly share my slide again, just to introduce our next speakers. So I'm very happy to be moderating the session. Uh, we are running a little bit late, so we will skip the Q&A. If you do have any questions, please do use the Q&A box to, to pose your questions, but we will probably only be able to answer them after the session. So, uh, honored to have two distinguished speakers in this session, Mr. Mashuru Afin, uh, the Managing Director and CEO of the Citibank Limited in Bangladesh, and Ms. Rosemary Bissett, Head of Sustainability Governance and Risk at the National Australia Bank in Australia. So a quick uh, introduction to Mr. Erfin first. He has been the in, in the position for the last three and a half years. He previously worked at Standard Chartered in Quata, ANZ Bank in Melbourne, American Express, Citibank and Easter Bank in Bangladesh. At Citibank, Mr. Erfin has been the driving force of the bank's transformation from a conventional bank to a modern and digital institution. He has successfully led several major projects, for example, the launch of the American Express brand in Bangladesh, the launch of the retail banking, priority banking, small and microfinance business, digital finance service, and women banking at the Citibank. Uh, introducing Rosemary Bissett now. Uh, she is the head of ESG risk management at National Australia Bank, uh, Ms. Bissett has responsibility for the integration of ESG risks, which include consideration of natural capital and climate risk into the NAB Group's risk management framework and for ESG related disclosures, such as those relating to human rights and climate change. This includes NAB's TCFD disclosures and coordinating NAB's work on climate risks. So Rosemary is also a director of the North East Water and Business Council for Sustainable Development Australia. Uh, okay, so thank you very much. Oh, sorry, let me just close the sharing of my screen first and see the speakers. Okay, hello, can you put the speakers on? I think if you speak, they will come on front, right? Oh, um... Yeah. I, I think so also. I think so, Yuki. Yes. But uh, hey. have I come on the screen? Yes, you have. So let me um, maybe then uh, ask you for your opening statement, Mr. Afin. Very, very glad to have you here. Thank you very much. So um, as introduced, you have been instrumental in driving the Citibank's uh, transformation to set, uh, to become a PRB member and to become an, an, an NZBA member as well. Um, so can you tell us um, the, the background about how you've come, you know, pers uh, how, come to that decision and how you have led your bank to sign up? Thank you. No, thank you, you, you key, thank you. Um, uh, thank you everyone here. Uh, we are a NZBA signatory. We are, uh, formidable institution in Bangladesh, a small economy as compared to other big countries, but still here there are small and big players. We are one of the big players, a large bank. Uh, 
um, you know, uh, given the size of the country and its economy. Country is also doing well. It's the now 33rd largest economy in the world in terms of GDP. Uh, we are the bank of uh, IFC, World Bank IFC. They're the single largest shareholder in the bank. We are also the Bank of American Express in Bangladesh. We are the single uh, territorial license holder for MX card issuing and uh, acquiring, which gives us 35% of the card market share. Now, uh, the third uh, third feather in our uh, in our hat is the is that we are a net zero banking alliance signatory, and uh, I have already started to tell the public and everyone that you know this is a matter of pride for us. The thing is, you see, like um, we, 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 we committed to net zero. There are reasons for that. If you look from Bangladesh perspective, if you look to the you know, global climate risk index, we're the seventh most vulnerable country um, in terms of you know, climate ad adversities that we may face. So um, and, 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 and we are not big contributor to the global carbon emissions, but uh, industries, industrialization is happening and uh, I also am a writer. If, my, if you do my name search, you will find my Wikipedia article uh, on me from not as a banker, but as a writer. You know, I love nature. I love trees. I, I see the lost rivers. I see the lost trees. You know, so it's like in everywhere you, you go, you see that, you know, there is mass scale, you know, mass scale uh, uh, annihilation of, you know, nature and, uh, and an environment is happening. So there is this personal angle to 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 why I I opted for you know making sustainable finance and green finance a core uh, object you know that must be achieved you know during my tenure in the bank. It's like you know central bank uh, has uh, launched sustainable finance policy in 2020, and uh, they also have uh, they also have given us the definition of green finance like in last year. Uh, we have done USD $600 million disbursed in the sustainable projects, which was, uh, which was, you know, 19% of the bank's total finance in this COVID era of last year. And also in green finance, which are project loans, you know, given to factories, is the second largest RNG producers in the, in the world, you know. So there are a huge number of factories and we are financing many RMGs, ready-made garment, uh, you know, exporters, those who basically import and then they export. So there is there is huge amount of risk they take in terms of environmental risk, social risk. So, you know, on the green finance side also, we, we financed USD $32 million of you know, project financing in green projects, which was, you know, around 5% of our total term loan. Um, we are mindful about the risks. The, the sea level is rising, you know, and uh, we have, we have, we have uh, lost already. There is a calculation I have seen that we have already lost something around four billion US dollars from 2020, uh, 20, 2019 to, to sorry, 2000 to 2019 due to the climate disasters. But I think that this figure is you know highly kind of reduced number. You know the loss should be more because we see almost hardly any respect for you know climate related you know. Um, uh, you know, code following or, or the policies and, and uh, respect for those in implementation of the policies. So as a bank, we thought that, you know, since we are entering, you know, into, into being a local bank, we are competing neck to neck with, you know, foreign bank like Strana Chartered in Bangladesh. We, we thought that it's our responsibility. And we are also, you know, during this uh, current prime minister's regime from 2009 to till today, country has, has kind of achieved power generation sufficiency. And the total power generations, 22% has been financed only by Citibank, you know, in, in terms of, you know, we are that big in the power sector. Then uh, Bangladesh also intended, you know, to be, to, 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 to generate one third of, of the country's power through renewable sources like solar, wind, hydro. So we are talking to different partners on that. So these are the, these are the background of you know why I, I wanted to be there, but also one of the strategic priorities of the bank, if you look at sustainable finance area, is to is to grow in women banking. And we disburse something like 14 million US dollars to, to something like 1800 women entrepreneurs in 2021, I mean last year. So you know the, the, the lot of awards started you know to follow. Uh, we got you know we got sustainable finance award from Central Bank itself for performance in last year. Then we got also awarded by 
awarded by, by, by another you know, global body called you know, Global Finance. But, but those things are not important. Only, only, only last week we got awarded Asia Money, Euro Money, an award for best CSR bank. I am channeling all the CSR dollars into mainly the health sector and education sector, but with deep focus on you know sustainable and green financing and and sustainable sustainable uh, kind of a development. So we spent something like two billion dollar plus two million dollar plus last year. You know it was a COVID hit year, but still we tried our best to channelize money into the CSR activities, which are more you know focused on women women's empowerment and also focused on 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 on. CSR that you know that that respects environment, so that's that's the background. Uh, then then there came NZ be a signatory. You know we became that. We are proud. We're the only local bank, and uh, we now is our time to learn actually, to 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 go to the next level. Thank you very much, Mr. Afin. So let me now turn to Ms. Rosemary, um, Eric. And, uh, and Remco also touched upon TCFD and as head of risk um, for NAB, how do you um, see the link between the, the risk side, the TCFD, uh, connecting with the net zero commitment uh, as part of that holistic approach on climate change? It's Yuki. Um, I think net zero commitments are intrinsically connected to climate related governance strategy, risk management, um, and the targets and metrics, which are outlined in the TCFD, and they form part of that holistic approach to climate change. When an organization makes a net zero commitment, it's a significant decision for the organization, and therefore it usually um, involves approval at a board level. And this was the case with NAB, um, climate is one of the impact areas that's incorporated into our group strategy and aligning our portfolio, lending portfolio to net zero emissions by 2050 is a key goal in our strategy, supported by working with customers to help decarbonise and build resilience to climate change and managing climate risk. Once a an organisation has made that decision, it influences strategy and it requires the use of scenarios like Remco mentioned, the IEA's net zero by 2050 roadmap, to understand the possible actions that can be taken in different sectors to transition to net zero and by when. Um, and that's going to be focused by agreeing metrics and targets and establishing decarbonisation trajectories. Um, then the actual targets for the relevant and material parts of the lending portfolio. Um, and I think the scenarios are helpful in understanding that different sectors in a portfolio will decarbonise at different speeds and they will have different dependencies that need to be managed in order to achieve that net zero outcome. And you have to take that into account. For example, um, building related sectors like mortgages and commercial property are partly dependent on decarbonisation of the electricity grid. So that means you have to think about what um, what might inhibit or prevent you from executing that commitment once you've made it or that goal. So to be able to steer sectoral portfolios towards these target requires client engagement. Um, and we've found we've had a really positive response from our clients they are absolutely thinking about this challenge too and many of them are making similar commitments and that then means supporting them with new types of products and services and in some cases to steer the portfolio and to understand the risk of not achieving that outcome it means changes to risk appetite and risk oversight practices and when you look at all of those things combined um, all of those those ingredients to successfully execute on a net zero commitment or goal um, basically are evidenced and you can see and, and people would be able to disclose around how they're meeting the TCFD framework in action. Thank you, Rosemary. So I guess um, in some parts of Asia, the TCFD is coming at the same time at the, as the net zero commitments and I guess what you're saying means that there may be economies of scale uh, gained by doing both at the same time. 
um, as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Going back to Mr. Erfin, so you were explaining that you have a big um, position in the power sector and that you are in a position to influence um, the, the economic transition of Bangladesh towards the net zero. Um, and so in Citibank, maybe I'd, I'd like to ask you about how you, how, what kind of institutional change is happening as a result of signing up to the net zero. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. So if you can make your um, statement quite short and brief, please. Thank you. Sure, I have switched on my stopwatch so that you know I don't you know cross my limit uh, in, in terms of uh, time management. Uh, the thing is, you know, like yes, we are big in power sector. We always are mindful about you know not financing anything in power plants which are coal based, uh, and uh, we are now uh, kind of you know talking to all of our customers. Uh, to, to so that in our portfolio on the solar based power plants grow and that has started happening you know like like i have you know five fingers similarly you know i have uh, i i am mindful about you know sectoral mix, mix of you know green financing and sustainable financing like first one my first priority is to is to is to is to is to grow sustainably in the power sector in the energy and resource efficiency sector and the second one is the establishment of the green industry you know Third one is the work environment, worker safety. You know that Bangladesh witnessed a big accident a few years ago, a tragic accident in one of the garment factories. You know, that's also part of sustainable financing. Then waste management is a big issue because we are very big. We are like our corporate lending book is in above uh, above four billion US dollars. You know, so 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 we are we are we are very mindful about that. We have incorporated all those in our ESDD environmental and you know social due diligence guidelines which are already integral part of our risk management you know and in of the part of the business and credit memos that we prepare for the board ifc's you know director uh, ex, ex mary lynch vice president she sits at the board miss rebecca brosnan you know she also carries the same flag that i carry in terms of lending we must not you know you know violate the esdd environmental and social due diligence codes you know so all of our finance projects you know go through the process of ESDD wherever applicable and uh, another thing you know I am I'm very mindful about is that you know unless you know the people there's those who work for this bank 8300 people it's a large institution in that sense you know so unless you know they are also embracing these you know principles they are also seeing value in decarbonization they are also seeing value in you know you know uh, value of you know loving the mother earth I do. I, I know that you know somewhere down the lines. In, in in some respect, we are into small and micro finance. We are into medium sector finance. We are into uh, retail uh, loan finance. You know, somewhere you know we will end up you know violating this. Like only a few days ago, I said that go slow on auto loan. I mean the car loan. I don't want to grow there because Dhaka city is choked in you know carbon emissions and you know people cannot breathe here. Citibank doesn't want to grow in in auto loan. So my people were kind of protesting like. What the CEO is talking, and I said that no, it's a decision taken. I will not grow into, uh, you know, giving, you know, importing cars. I will not going to support that unless you know people are bringing battery operated cars or electric cars or something like that. So I have kind of virtually stopped that. So these are the awareness building things that we are doing. You know, I as the CEO must, you know, carry the flag. Must must be mindful about all this. So like we celebrated the art Day for the first time in the bank in a big big way. Only a few 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 days ago and that world environment day so these kind of days you know the women uh, you know women uh, the day for women you know the 8th of march uh, or, or uh, yeah that, that was celebrated we, we brought in a lot of you know great speakers there these things are all all, all all for 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 making people aware and the last one i would like to say is that you know we are going to introduce a five year plan and strategy on sustainable finance having the six goal including carbon emission reduction plan and including growing in the energy efficient sector in terms of energy financing. So we are making also progress a good headway with low cost green funds like Proparco, AFD of France and DEG, DEG of you know, Western Europe. So that, that talk is going on with ADB also, Asian Development Bank, serious talk is going on. I enjoy $1.6 billion worth of trade lines from these global multilaterals. And you know, I would like to grow in trade business but they will not give me fund if I'm not respecting all these codes. So I'm very mindful about that. We are, we are, we are, we are, we are going ahead uh, in with, with, you know, wish us luck. We're a new bank, new NZBA member. 
uh, we, we, we are taking it up very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Afin. And good, good luck to you. And we'll be very um, happy to, to join your journey as you never find. So, Rosemary, apologies, we really are running out of time. So, if you can make your statement very brief about um, your same question about your transformation at NAB and uh, maybe specifically around the change in the risk appetite that you were mentioning earlier in terms of product development. Yep. And I will also say um, and reinforce what Remco said. The Participation in industry initiatives has been extremely valuable. So NAB is a member of the UNF, UNF, UNFI um, TCFD program, which has been absolutely fantastic. We are also we were also a PRB collective commitment to climate action um, signatory and um, a net zero banking alliance signatory. And that has been really, really helpful in being able to share knowledge with peers, muddle our way through um, working out how you do things, and um, it has been hugely valuable. So we've made a number of changes to governance strategy and risk management, particularly the risk appetite that I mentioned, and we're working through establishing our decarbonisation um, trajectories, metrics and targets now. And that's covering areas like power gen, thermal coal, oil and gas, cement, aluminium, the typical high emitting sectors, and then it will include others as well. Um, that's actually meant we've had to build, spend time building capability, even just to baseline our financed emissions in some of those sectors so that we're prepared for target setting. And we started working on that baselining in 2020. Um, and now, absolutely, we're working hard to support our customers to get there, because if you're going to put those strategies in place and those trajectories and targets, then you've got to take your customers along on the journey. And that means that we need to help them. And so working on green and sustainability linked products to help incentivize them to get to their decarbonisation goals helps us in turn to shift the shape of our portfolio and meet our net zero goal. Additionally, and that comes to the point that you specifically asked about, we have made changes to appetite. So we've reviewed particularly oil and gas and coal at the moment. We've capped our oil and gas exposures and they'll stay flat through to 2025 and then they will reduce from 2026 through to 2050 aligned to the net zero um, emissions 2050 scenario of the IEA, and that's allowing us to get a measured reorientation of client activity, ensuring that we can continue to support clients that are committed to transition, because the nature of our economy needs means we need to help our customers transition. But we've also restricted appetite to help that shaping of the portfolio. So we will only consider directly financing um, greenfield gas if there's absolutely a national energy security issue. Um, we will not um, directly finance greenfield oil and gas projects or onboard board new co um, customers, which are predominantly focused on oil extraction. So we've looked at what the pathways um, suggest in terms of what we need to achieve to get to net zero. And um, there's some areas like um, oil and gas extraction in um, the Arctic um, wildlife refuge and the Antarctic refuge, where we've basically said we will not provide finance. Um, in relation to coal, we've done something similar. So we will not finance new oil material expansions of coal-fired power generation facilities. We've, up, we've capped thermal coal mining exposures at 2019 levels and have been reducing that um, since. Our goal is to get to 50% of our exposures by 2026 and reduce effectively to zero by 2030. Apart from residual performance guarantees for rehabilitation for existing co thermal coal mining assets, because we believe it's responsible to help the rehabilitation process. Um, and we won't finance new thermal coal mining projects or take on new to bank thermal coal mining customers. So those sorts of restrictions in terms of appetite help us shape that portfolio so that we support our existing customers as they decarbonise, but we also um, 
change the shape of the portfolio in terms of what we'll accept in terms of new lending. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, I think what you're saying is that, you know, you've always known your customers well, but you're seeing them in another, you know, light. You're, you're getting much more information on their CO2 and business plans that are, you know, totally new conversation for a lot of the relationship managers that have yeah. traditionally been in that space. A, a really positive discussion, Yuki. Um, we've developed a transition diagnostic. Um, and that is allowing us to engage with our customers and to assess the maturity of their transition plans as well. And yeah. that's in pilot at the moment. Okay, great. Thank you, Rosemary. So I'll pass on quickly to Anders, who will be moderating the next and last session. And we are running late, so we hope that you can stay on uh, participants for this last but very important uh, session on credible net zero commitments. So over to you, Anders. Yuki, um, I see that we have about five minutes left of the session, so we might <laughs> steal another 10 minutes or so from uh, the audience and the panelists if, uh, if they're available to sit in a little bit extra so that our distinguished panelists some time to uh, to give their uh, their input. Um, so we're very very grateful to have uh, Luan here from CIMB, who's a senior managing director and head of group sustainability and corporate responsibility at CIMB. Uh, Luan's been with uh, CIMB for a number of years now, and we have um, Helge, who's the uh, new Chief Sustainability Officer at uh, DBS, recently joined DBS from ING, where, um, where he was uh, engaged for um, over 10 years in, in various uh, roles. So I think we'll go straight into the, uh, the session um, so you can listen more to um, our panelists than, than me. Um, so, we're talking a little bit about the nuts and bolts here. Um, what it actually do banks need to do? What is required in order to make this decarbonisation um, journey? To use that word with the uh, finance, with the clients the financial institutions have. So, I mean, most banks now have some sort of voluntary or um, or because of regulation, uh, they're starting to do action on climate risks and integrating this into financing decisions. And there are now, of course, expectations on net zero commitments coming on top of this. So starting with you, Helge, could you maybe provide a, a short introduction to your bank, your commitments to climate action, and how do you translate this kind of action, uh, this kind of commitment, apologies, into action uh, in, in your bank, Helge? Yeah, thank you so much, Anders. Much appreciated. Actually, really a great panel, and I like the energy, uh, and I also like the fact that you use the word action a lot, because that's indeed what we needed. Um, I had to smile a little bit when I listened to Remco, the reason being that many people, many, many, many colleagues at DBS have had sleepless nights for a very long time now, because we have concluded the first four steps that he was describing, and I'm happy to talk a little bit about this, how we put it into action. But before I do that, maybe just a quick frame. So. At DBS, we have a fairly comprehensive uh, sustainability strategy. We have developed three pillars. Pillar one, we call responsible banking. That's all about empowering our clients to being more sustainable. And the cornerstone piece here is that we are also committed to being net zero in our financed emissions, our scope three, if you will, by 2050. Then we have scope two, which we call responsible business practices. That's more around how we conduct ourselves as an organization, cuts across many different things like diversity and inclusion. And on the environmental side, we are committed to being net zero in our own operations, our scope one and two, if you will, by the end of this year. So by the end of 2022. And then we have pillar three, which we call impact beyond banking, where we support businesses with a triple bottom line and community causes and our board just announced that they approved another 100 million Singapore dollars to support this as well. Now, cutting to, through the chase, what we need is speed and quantum, right? I think that's also a common understanding of everyone. This is why, Anders, I like the word on, on action. Uh, we are quite excited that very soon 
we will publish white papers. And in these white papers, we will outline how we selected science-based pathways for decarbonization, all aligned with net zero. Uh, and we will also outline how we selected science-based interim 2030 targets. And we are so excited because um, if you look at the number of sectors we will cover, it's nine, and the scope within these uh, sectors, it's going to be the, one of the most comprehensive coverage that you would see out there. And um, we just want to also create momentum uh, and hopefully uh, everyone, of course, uh, jointly we, we move forward. Um, these nine sectors that are in there cover the highly polluting ones, for example, oil and gas uh, and so on and so forth. So it's really very exciting. The next key step then is translating this into real action on the road and getting the topic out of the boardroom into the trenches. And that is, of course, all to do with how do we um, build this into our account planning? How do we build this into our sector strategies? How do we empower our employees to interact with our clients? A little bit aligned with what also Rosemary from the NAP just said, and that is that, uh, really our, our next step. But setting a short-term 2030 target was for us absolutely instrumental because I think we probably all agree here on this call that we need to really act super fast for the next seven, eight or, or so years. Thank you very much, uh, Elliot. So, uh, speed and quantum, I, I like that uh, that framing. Luan, um, CIMB has, has been one of the, uh, I think, one of the first banks in the uh, Asia Pacific region to, to really make significant commitments towards um, net zero in action on, um, on high risk sectors. Um, I mean, for your bank, is, is climate risk kind of a, a first? natural step towards net zero or or how do you approach this uh, within cimb yeah, and there's um just a quick introduction to cimb i guess uh, we're an asean uh based bank um we've got a total assets of, our, of around 150 billion usd just to give a bit of a background um we were one of the drafting members of unep fi principles for responsible banking so very glad to be part of that and we started sometime only in 2019 uh, looking at sustainability. So, so um, you know, uh, people like Rosemary and, you know, DPS, I think, um, have been doing this for a while. We we really were the new kid on the block um, starting in 2019. Now, um, I'm not going to go through our, our strategy because I think at the heart of it, most banks' sustainability strategy would be quite similar. So what we're doing um, within our own enterprise, number two, what we're doing with our clients, and number three, what we're doing with communities. So pretty straightforward. Now, um, Coming to what our goals are, um, very much aligned, I think, with uh, many of the many of the other banks. So we're looking at um, achieving carbon neutral operations by 2030. So that's our scope one and two, largely, and um, net zero, including financed emissions, of course, uh, by 2050. And we are a signatory to CCCA and NZBA. Um, now, in terms of you know risk versus opportunities, and I think the two both sides need to be pursued in tandem um, in everything that we do um, from, you know, our, our sourcing to our um, own operations and, and buildings to what we do with our clients, to communities. In everything we do, we look at the two sides. One is how do you minimize the harm or the negative impact uh, that we are creating or potentially creating with our clients, suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, we do know that just minimizing is never going to get you to net zero. So how do we at the same time create the positive impacts through clients, products, et cetera, to get to that net zero and eventually, I guess, um, aspirationally, uh, net positive, right, um, in terms of climate. And um, however, I must say that um, for us, when we started, we were at zero in 2018, the easier conversation with the board was really on risk, right? Because, you know, if you say, okay, look, we've got this much in our portfolio, and if this happens, we're gonna, we could potentially lose this much money. And and this is really what gets them to sit up and go, oh, huh, hmm, maybe we should do something, right? Whereas, and, 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 and I think on the risk side, it's a lot clearer what needs to be done. It's not easy, um, but it's clearer. On, in terms of the steps. When it comes to positive impact, 
you know, it's so broad. Um, there are so many things and it's so uncertain. I mean, what technologies for, for some, what are decarbonization pathways? It's so broad. So we started really with the risk side, but really both sides need to go in tandem. Yeah, thanks, Duane. Um, so how do you do that in practice then? Is it, um, because next year is a long-term target and obviously, you know, bank loans are generally much shorter than um, these long-term targets that we are um, reaching towards. So with your clients, do you then focus on mitigation or adaptation, maybe both? And does this differ depending on the market or the sector you're looking at? Yeah, so there's the there's always that that uh, um, temptation to go. Yeah, you know what? Let's just do net zero twenty fifty. I'm not going to be around at that point in time. Um, and you know, there, there I, I know people who think that way, but um, because we are part of NZB and CCCA, and I'm glad we are because it signals that we are, you know, we, we are we are serious about this and. And it's not just you know setting a, a this this massive twenty fifty target, which is way a long way away, and then um, not uh, having intermediate targets. So as you know, we will be setting targets, and pretty soon for twenty thirty for the for the key nine sectors, we are in the midst of baselining. So so, um, I mean just just to give you a view of you know we only had a baseline of scope one and two in twenty nineteen. And even that, not a full baseline. 2020 was more or less full baseline of scope one and two. And we are still feeling assurance in some areas. And um, so this year, uh, only this year, we, we are baselining at scope three um, using PCAF. We have started looking at alignment, temperature alignment to, to scenarios, um, looking at things like a packed to tool. Um, but it's it's as, and especially hard for, for those sectors with no clear um, pathways like cemented steel, but how do we actually do it? So it's not just about setting the targets, but impact it is, right? That's the word that you use. How, how do we actually do it? And I think there are a couple of control points. Um, first of all, is at the transaction and the client level. So if you think about, you know, the, the I guess the, the bathtub analogy, right? Um, you've got loans or financing coming in. So you need to turn down that tap. Right. So for new stuff coming in, how do you ensure that it's not increasing your your, you know, um, your your temperature of, of your portfolio? Um, and then at the same time, um, if that turns if that turns down or off, you know that your book will taper eventually. But also we do um, measure that um, exposure at the overall portfolio level and we have kind of overall sector limits that will come down um, eventually. Um, keyword being eventually we're still working on that. <laughs> um, between mitigation and adaptation, I think it's mitigation first, typically, um, because that is um, people see it more. Um, and of course, it depends on which industry you're in. If you're on the kind of impacting end versus, uh, you know, where there's carbon tax and all coming in, or if you're on the receiving end. So pretty different conversations depending on sector. Okay. Uh, thanks, Glenn. That makes a lot of sense. So. Um, Helgi, I think we talked a little bit previously about the, um, you know, the need for a bank to empower clients to de decarbonize, uh, de decarbonize. Can, can you talk a little bit about the challenges and how you've worked with clients to try to resolve this? And maybe also if you can touch a little bit on, on the social, uh, elements of, um, of decarbonization and the the just transition. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. I liked how Luanne just described, uh, you know, the journey that an organization goes through first focusing on risk and then of the opportunities. And indeed, um, if you think it through how to engage with uh, with clients, it's a seismic shift. We need to almost reimagine how we deal with clients because ultimately we are provider of capital. If our clients don't get to net zero, we don't get to net zero unless we shrink our balance sheet to zero, which is probably not a very good business proposition. So um, as we think all of this through, it's indeed very important to get the operating model right. And there are probably at least four key focus areas for us. 
The first one may sound very fluff, but I think must not be underestimated. To us, it really all starts with purpose and the right culture. DBS has the purpose to be the best bank for a better world. And the latter part really encapsulates our approach to sustainability. Maybe it's a little bit in our origins as the development bank of, of Singapore. But instilling this purpose and having the right culture must not be underestimated. So there's a lot of awareness building, uh, tone from the top, et cetera, PP, et cetera, PP. Then you go into harder issues, for example, governance. So we have, for example, just announced in March that we've now established a board level sustainability committee. And to us, this is instrumental. Governance is key. We all don't quite know what's going to happen in the future. So we need to make sure we have the right rules and regulations internally that really forces us uh, to think everything through. So governance to us is key. And we've also announced, for example, a climate expert as an independent director to really get a lot of intelligence from the outside world into DBS additionally, very key. Um, then you need to design the right KPIs. Let's be honest, in the end of the day, KPIs shape behaviors, and that's really very, very critical. Then uh, as we went through our baselining and target setting, I have to be honest, that's a lot of hard, sweaty work. And you will undoubtedly then be faced with issues around ESG data quality or availability. You will be faced with uh, issues around uh, modeling all of this, uh, but we shouldn't let the perfection be the enemy of the good. So the ESG data are what they are, and hopefully they will become better. But also empowering internally people with the right data and information is a huge challenge. Uh, here in Singapore, for example, our local regulator, the MAS, has a very powerful project called MAS Greenprint, uh, which tries to tackle, for example, um, the issue around uh, ESG data quite well. And then the last point is really capacity building. I mean, ultimately, as we just said, we reimagine the way we talk to our clients, right? All of a sudden, we have to talk about decarbonization strategies. And undoubtedly, you're going to need some experts, right? You need really dedicated people, either in a sustainable finance team and or in the respective sector teams, like an automotive specialist or a chemical specialist or an oil and gas specialist. But you need to generally provide uh, for a lot of capacity building. So what we are currently doing is really upgrading and fine tuning our, what we call sustainability learning campus. So I have a dream and the dream is that all 33,000 people of DBS understand the why I'm empowered, I'm motivated and, and go uh, and really support the journey. So these are a couple of things. And then just maybe 30 seconds on the social, which shouldn't be 30 seconds because it's instrumental, especially in Asia. The way we look at social really is we need to concurrently develop it. Yeah, we can't tackle the E without concurrently tackling the S. So on the one hand side, we will never have social justice without a healthy planet. And that's especially true in Asia, because climate change will hit poorer communities much more than the more affluent ones. So you need to do this. On the flip side, if you only look at the E, but you don't look at the S, and for example, you accelerate the phase down of coal and you don't take care of the families that depend on the income, that also can't be a good solution. So you need to really concurrently develop it. Uh, and that's how we how we look at it at DBS. Great, thanks so very much, uh, Felge. That's, uh, those are important considerations also to take into account, yes, also in, in the just transition. And uh, I have been um, asked by the moderators to, uh, by the organizers to, to wrap up uh, and <clears throat> around about this time, unfortunately. So, um, Luan, maybe um, if you can have some short um, final words from your side um, on, you know, anything in particular that you want to convey. I know that we, we had a little bit of a, a pre-session discussion around nature-related issues. Is there some words of inspiration or warning that you want to uh, convey to the audience, Luan? Yes, um, I would say, you know, don't wait for regulations to come. We can see it already. The regulations are accelerating so fast. Something that was what you thought you knew 12 months ago is completely different now, right? And you don't want to be caught on the back foot because you know it's going to come. So start preparing now. Go out and look for people. Look for talent. There are so few of them. So start preparing. Start building your capacity and... Um, Get involved with groups like um, UNEP and PRB because that's how you learn. You learn by doing and doing together. So that's my word of advice. Thanks, Glenn. I appreciate that. Um, Helge, I'm going to give the last words to you before we hand back to Yuki. 
that that's a huge responsibility let, let mm -hmm. me come back to speed and quantum we need to start we need to start running yeah let 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 us not be the, the perfection be the enemy of the good there are loads of challenges out there but we need to get running thank you thanks very much um yuki back to you thank you very much to the panel and anders um yeah don't wait for regulation and speed i totally agree with that and uh yeah, we are now seeing that regulators are not giving you enough time to adjust. The, 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 um, the, the time that they give you to prepare is getting shorter and shorter. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for the speakers, uh, for, uh, for participating and for, for you, the participants, for staying on uh, longer. Uh, I hope this has been a useful webinar for you and your institutions in your transition. And we hope that UNEPFI, WWF, the GFANS, um, ICBI, we are all there to support you and we look forward to, to you know, being with you in the journey ahead. So thank you and we will close this webinar. Thank you very much for your participation. See you next time.